Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Writing for Peace Sunday Live. We're really excited this evening um, to have Leah Prepura here with us. And we're going to start out with, since it's our 10th anniversary, I'm going to start out with an excerpt from a former writer that might be um, connected to our organization, or perhaps they're just connected through peace. And this is Denise Levertov. And she wrote quite a bit about peace. But this, um, as I did in the last time, I kind of echoed off of or bounced off of the other writer that was here. And this time, um, it connects to, to Leah's work. Mm -hmm. And here we go. It's from the, the poem Voyage. It's actually a framed broadside I took off the wall. These are prayers to celebrate, not to beseech. Among them, leaning towards the water, we voyage our voyaged, seen. We share among us the depth of day. We are born through it swiftly as arcs of spray. And our wonderful guest tonight, a continuing theme, one of my favorite themes in connection to a writing is, is looking or seeing and being out in the world and, and observing. Leah Papura is the author of nine collections of essays, poems, and translations. A finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award for On Looking Essays, Sarah Band Books. Her awards include Guggenheim, NEA, and Fulbright Fellowships, as well as four Pushcart Prizes, the Associated Writing Programs Award in Nonfiction, and others. Her work appears in The New Yorker, The New Republic, Orion, The Paris Review, The Georgia Review, Agni, Emergence, and elsewhere. She lives in Baltimore, Maryland, where she is writer in residence at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She has taught in the Rainier Writing Workshops MFA program at Breadloaf Writers Conference, the University of Iowa's nonfiction MFA program, and at conferences, workshops, and graduate programs throughout the country. Her newest collection of poems is It Shouldn't Have Been Beautiful, a penguin, and her latest collection of essays is All the Fierce Tethers by Sarah Band Books. Welcome, Leah. It's great to see you here. When, um, we start out with a question, mm -hmm. that, that, that question that we pose, and that is, um, what is a formative book from your youth? What was something that was significant to you? Well, um, first, thank you all for being here um, on this Sunday night, I, I'm beaming in to you from Baltimore, Maryland, which is an hour from Washington, and you know what's going on there. Um, we feel all the heat waves sort of coming off um, the like 20,000 troops and armed vehicles patrolling the near empty streets. Um, and this is such a warm, and um, comforting place to be. So I'm really happy to be with you all. Um, I didn't tell Juniper this, but that question, the what is your, you know, what is a formative book sends fear through the hearts of most writers. So <laughs> it seems, it seems easy. Um, and it's almost impossible to frame up and offer a single formative book. Um, I read, so much as a kid and um, when I thought back about the question really the most um, the most direct and honest way to answer that for me was to think in periods oh. so you know there was there was you know a Dickinson period and a post World War II Eastern European poets period not when I was a kid this was in college um, <laughs> And, and I remember reading in, in broad chunks, um, but if I were to, to say um, something about a truly formative book, it was the Good Earth Almanac for mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. um, and this book um, had, I mean, I read it constantly and it had all kinds of instructions uh, that a kid from Long Island really needed to know, like how to make pemmican and tan animal hides with, you know, acorns or brains, um, how to survive falling through the ice, um, how to properly use an axe. 
So this book was just fascinating. Um, and I still have it um, within, literally within reach. You know, it's sort of right here um, in my writing room. Um, and I think that was really the source of um, the way I just framed up imagining and could tell myself what it was I wanted to imagine into, you know, the kinds of lives that were not, um, not available to me other than by way of the imagination. Yes. So. Well, it, it, with it being such a contrast to where you were and all these um, <laughs> different aspects that it makes me wonder if that helped form your particularized attention to some of these, um, you know, whether it's the maggots, you know, or the, in the, in the morgue and some of the details in the morgue, these different details that come through that you're looking for something um, out of the norm, maybe. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that sounds likely. What, what would you like to read first for us? Um, I, I am go I'm going to read a selection of poems and, and short excerpts from essays. Um, and these are from my latest collection, It Shouldn't Have Been Beautiful. They're very short poems. In fact, most of them are, you can sort of measure, um, you know, by, by two fingers. Um, they, they work almost um, in the way that, that, that koans might work, though I didn't write them with that frame in mind. Um, they go by very quickly. There's no narrative to hold on to, so, um, or to sort of carry you along. So I'm going to read them, uh, or a few of them. I'm going to read twice. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, so here we go. This first one is called Solitude. No one home. Snow packing the morning in. Much white nothing filling up. A V of birds pulling the silence until some dog across the street barks and breaks what I call my peace. What a luxury annoyance is. It bites off and keeps just enough of what I think I want to be endless. So um, one of the really interesting things about reading poems years after they were written uh, is the way that, that time recasts scenes. Um, and what solitude meant years ago is very, very different than what solitude means now. Yes. Right? Yes. So, yes. Is that one that you were going to read a second time for us? Sure, I can, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that again. No one home. Snow packing the morning in. Much white nothing filling up. A V of birds pulling the silence until some dog across the street barks and breaks what I call my peace. What a luxury annoyance is. It bites off and keeps just enough of what I think I want to be endless. This next one is called Uncertainty. These poems are specially chosen for the moment. <laughs> Plucked from this book and thrown directly at, 2020, at 2021. Okay. Uncertainty. It's not a place, but I am grateful to be in it, where endings and known things complicate. And I, the judge I know myself to be, go to review the very heavy declarations I so often lay down like law. It's not a place at all. I just practice there, assemble some beliefs, disturb others, 
and put the extras into a pile for mosaics, one of my big projects for the future. So um, I will try that one one more time. Just lay that in. Uncertainty. It's not a place, but I'm grateful to be in it where endings and known things complicate, and I, the judge I know myself to be, go to review the very heavy declarations I so often lay down like law. It's not a place at all. I just practice there, assemble some beliefs, disturb others, and put the extras into a pile for mosaics, one of my big projects for the future. Um, and the last one in this little set is gratitude. It softens want into nothing mean and lack is not so dark anymore. Things can be a little dim, less than ideal, and still a maze, as when there's been enough grief and you aren't any longer bowing to it. One day, the pain having stopped isn't a moment. It isn't brief. It keeps going. So, um, go ahead. Those are, those are wonderful. I, I had the pleasure of, of listening to not the same ones, but some of these short um, poems um, on a video lecture, uh, part of yesterday and today. And I was hoping that you would read some of them. It made me think about um, a lot of different things. But um, the uh, it, I listened to an on being podcast with Frank Wilczek. Did you happen to listen to that one? I listened to it a while ago and then I listened to it, um, to it in the last 24 hours. And he's a th theoretical physicist and a mathematician. And one of the things he was talking about is symmetric laws and equations in nature that support an enormous possibility and transformation. And I don't know that you would necessarily consider yourself a nature poet but you write a lot about nature and your observations and, and oftentimes what maybe others may not want to pay attention to at different times. But he goes on to say, and this is where it connects back with your short poems. He goes on to say that of a deep truth, its opposite is also a deep truth. Mm -hmm. And you um, read some of these poems and some of them were the same ones in the lecture. And you said that they often argue with each other or contrast each other. And it made me wonder about whether you would consider those deep truths. But further, as you, as you were laying out this book and you have contrasting deep truths when you spread them out on the bed or you spread them out on the floor or wherever you spread them, was it difficult to decide on the deep truth or the arc of this narrative when they were competing so much or arguing with each other? Wow, so first, I'm gonna back it way up and say that um, I think especially now sort of in this historical geological <laughs> moment, we are, we are all um, thinking of ourselves in some way as nature poets, right? Poets who are profoundly attentive to um, what it means to breathe air and what it means to consider yourself an animal. Um, I see more and more, um, you know, poets reframing or recasting their, their sensibilities, um, or at least noting that certain parts of their sensibilities, you know, should rightfully be called nature poet. So I see, you know, my, my, my work as you know, profoundly engaged with the natural world and myself as the animal engaging. Um, 
So it's it's a it's a con nature poet or nature is is so complex and um, uh, and um, I think we need we need new ways to to you know to to talk about um, our inextricable engagement with with others of the other than humans. So um, as for the wrangling that you talked about, um, yeah, there's so much, and I'm sure so many of you who are who are writers out there have that have that moment where you say a truth um, and almost immediately, uh, right, it's kin or, or, or sibling truth comes around and like smacks you on the back of the head and, and <laughs> you experience this moment of paralysis, right? Until you start sort of hatering in and cross hatching your perspective, right? Your, your casting or your, your truth. Um, and I think that's really what art wants to do, right? Is not become paralyzed um, by uh, the co-incidental, you know, cooperative kind truths out there, but really um, find what it is, you know, you specifically want to lean on, right? Or look into. So um, when poems or essays argue back and forth, it's really actually kind of thrilling. Um, you know, I, I feel the sensation is something um, that's very holistic to me and very um, authentic. Mm -hmm. um, I almost feel like, you know, the arguing, which can happen essay to essay, right? You write something and you realize a little seed from one plants itself in the next essay and then on and on and um, suddenly you've got kind of a world view. Um, yes. So the arguing is, is kind of a, um, uh, uh, a sign that, you know, that things are snapping, I'm alive. Um, and trying to listen in multiple directions at once. Yes, and, and then it also follows this um, uh, theoretical physicist. It, it follows the symmetry in nature also. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that was very interesting. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a, a question. It says, my question is very similar to Michael's with a slight variation. How does a poem slip into an essay or vice versa? And also thanks to Veronica Patterson, Poet Laureate of Loveland and Extraordinary Human for introducing me to Leah Perpera's work. <laughs> nice. Wow. So how does a poem slip into an essay or, or vice versa? And I, I had that um, also, like at what point do you know it will be a poem or what point will it be an essay after you've gathered these observations and you're moving forward? Is there a knowing? Yeah, you know, it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a rhythm of 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 feeling, rhythm of thinking um, that dictates it. You know, I I I pretty rarely sit down to write an essay um, or sit down to write a poem. There's an, an there's a rhythmic um, there's some kind of cadence that clicks in at a certain point, and whatever the perception is wants to. Um, express in in a particular cadence and sometimes it's the cadence of a sentence um, or the duration of a sentence and other times it is the you know the tempo of um, sounds that want to live uh, more closely together or images that need a certain kind of you know space and light between them so um, they're the kind they're they're I, like I said, I, I, I rarely sit down with a particular form in mind. Um, I do a lot of just freehand work, just journal work and observations. And um, and that often helps just getting, you know, being sort of in the practice of, of writing, uh, writing down observations. Um, I have, this is what the end of a day can look like for me. <laughs> I don't remember my notebook. So these are, here's one, here's another, you know, it's, um, so th those all get transcribed into notebooks. Well, so if you, ever want, if you're ever willing to part with some of those that have already been published, <laughs> I would do something with book arts with them. <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> yes. So there's a lot there, but, but love, lovely, lovely answer about, about process. So um, there are no other questions at this point, but how about 
what how about reading us reading to us something new something new. okay very good um i'm i will read a very short meaning like two paragraph essay mm -hmm. um this is this one is called blood spots two mm -hmm. and it's part of a series of um essays on blood spots in baltimore so there's blood spots one, two, three, four, and then a little coda essay. Um, and again, I had not set out to trail blood spots in my city, though it's profoundly, disturbingly easy to do that. Um, you know, one observation led to an essay, and then you know there was another occasion for observing blood. And then the lens was affixed, and it was um, in that way easier to sort of magnetize toward uh, toward those observations. So this is this is blood spots one. I followed the spots. Oh wait, is this thing I wanted to read? Hang on. Um, blood, I'm going to read you blood spots too. Thank you. Coming slant in sheets, steaming the sidewalk midsummer, then stopping, the first rain since the murder on University Parkway, across the street from my son's girlfriend's house, a few miles from ours, two blocks from another friend whose blood I've seen body I've tended, that complicated wound on her hip the antibiotics couldn't fix, years ago now. She stayed for a while in an oxygen chamber. Maybe it helped, she can't remember. When she came home that first week, I'd go to her. And as dinner heated and the girls ran around, I took off the bandage, cleaned at the edges, replaced the dressing. It was so deep, the bone flashed like a moon between night hills. Here on the sidewalk, rain kindled up all these live reds. Root of an oak scuffed clean of its bark, big hearted coleus, gas and electric flag marking a line, plastic bag stuck to the curb and translucing. Then a few rusty spots shown up through a puddle no, the feel of finding them lit. No real shining went on. They embellished nothing. They marked an event but could not say the story. A guy came toward me with his collie. He knew what I was looking for because he was too. As we passed each other, there it was, all the mutual knowing. And we looked away fast. No words for the passing, the rain gone, the blood dimming, and we were ashamed of living like that, as if days go on, which they do, and for being the ones who by living confirm it. Beautiful. One, one of the things that I thought about, um, and I know I often go back when I talk about it, it's to your On Looking collection, but I've read some from all, almost all of them, I think, um, when I was doing, taking stock, except the ones before, before that, I think, but is that there's this um, metacognitive um, element to your writing that you're thinking about, you're thinking as you're writing about whatever you're writing about in a way. And I wouldn't have made that observation before teaching as an adjunct and all the big push for metacognition. But I think that that's one of the elements that um, I admire is that you're, it, it's woven in to um, not just your human reflection and looking away, whether it's the shame or the uncomfortableness, but it's, uh, it's in the line and, and with the beat and poetic and, and there in the essay is beautiful. So it's, it's an observation I thought about over the last couple of days. And I, I, I value that as a writer. Mm -hmm. I value that as a reader. 
but I, I think I value it most as the simple humanity of putting it out there too. So um, we have another question, um, if you don't mind. And sure. that is, do you ever blend both poetry and essays in the same piece? No, I don't really. Um, but the really full answer to that question is um, that my poems often read like tiny essays, right? They have like a little, uh, and I only recognized this sort of way after the last collection, um, but they have like a little seed sized thesis, right? And the essays read like really long extended poems. So <laughs> some tracks got crossed there somewhere um, along the line. And um, so in that way, I, in that way it was kind of a, that's a profound question because it does, it does speak to um, what is going on at the, the hearts of these forms and ways that I'm, I'm sort of pushing the form to um, hold very different elements and elements that are kind of um, unconventionally connected, you know, to, you know, the traditional sense of poetry as lyric and essay as rhetorical. Um, mm -hmm. I just sort of um, seem to have switched those tracks. Well, I was um, listening to, I can't remember which one it was now, I apologize, I don't have a name for it, but it, it, felt, um, as I was processing it, it felt like a poem as it was moving through me. Mm -hmm. and, and I love that about um, sections or passages or pieces of your essays because they are so poetic and in, in <laughs> in, in language and in how it moves through the body. Mm -hmm. I, I'm glad those, those roads got crossed, yeah. those rails <laughs> got crossed. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, there are no other questions right now. So how about if you read some more for us, please? I would be happy to. Okay, I'm turning back to the poems. Um, and I think I'll read Winter Night. I think I'll just read this once. Winter Night. It nibbles on the horizon. Then it's quiet, magnifies space, then us until we break into so many pieces to which it responds with indifference, we say, though really that's just an enormity of the cold and dark variety. So it really was very interesting choosing poems to read tonight because I'm, I'm uh, as we all are, um, like minute to minute aware of our nowness, right? And of being like here in this moment as we are told unprecedented and historical. Um, but it, we, we do have that, you know, frame around us right now. And so um, I, I was very conscious of sort of reading poems into, into this, moment. Um, and this is called uh, tropism, as in the plant variety. Plants are very slow. You have to slow way down to observe a plant's decisions. Networks, rhizomatics that look so like our will, intention. Then there's the question of consciousness. No central brain, though adaptations like go around the rock, share, unify, tide others over during dry spells. Or what else to call it? Intelligence? Thinking? This way of being not paralyzed by the problem at hand. Lovely. So I've been thinking a lot about tree time um, and the kinds of um, maneuvers that, that 
plants go through in their bodies when, you know, they sort of track sunlight, they curl up, they open up, they turn their little heads up, you know, at just the right moment. So um, I'll read this one more time. Plants are very slow. You have to slow way down to observe a plant's decisions. Networks, rhizomatics that look so like our will, intention. And then there's the question of consciousness. No central brain, though adaptations like go around the rock, share, unify, tide others over during dry spells. Or what else to call it? Intelligence? Thinking, this way of being, not paralyzed by the problem at hand. Make me um, think of the, let's see if I can find it, that physicist statement that um, um, symmetric laws or equations in nature support enormous possibility for transformation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. So um, we have um, a question if you would like to, or we can go on to the next poem. What works yeah, better? We can do a question. Let's break it up. Let's have a question. So the next one is What do you think of the cross genre pieces that may include poetry, prose, photography, even some flash or short fiction? Can this work? If there is a bit of theme through through line, or do you feel like this style, quite popular now, is a little more disconcerting for the reader? And that's from um, Laura Mahal. Huh. Oh, I am not at all disconcerted. I think it's great. I I think I think creating forms is absolutely what we should all be doing, and and kind of boldly. Um, you know, it's, um, uh, when I, when I first started writing essays, they, they, you know, they sort of didn't fit right in, into kind of more traditional essays. And then I, I kind of hit the wave of what was at the time being called lyric essays, which was fine, you know, for me, by me, didn't particularly bother me, but, um, you know, to me, it, it's, it's really the shape of my thinking, you know, you can call it lyric if you'd like, that's a good word and a, a kind word. Um, but the, so, you know, that, that was sort of the publishing world trying to, you know, get some label sort of affixed so it could be a thing out there. And so any kind of work you're, you know, doing, it will be a, a kind of, you know, front runner to something that will, <laughs> will have an official label uh, at some point, right? So hybrid work um, is a really big um, uh, umbrella term that takes into account, you know, pretty much anything you'd like to splice together. Um, I have an essay, um, written as an artist's book. So I, I did, you know, I found a kid's uh, geography text textbook, tiny thing, from the 40s and, you know, collaged and wrote an essay um, that's in All the Fierce Tethers, but wrote, you know, the essay sort of through that, that book, and that is officially called an artist book, um, which makes me very happy. But I think it absolutely can work. Um, the form of uh, hybridity that that you were asking about, um, and you know, you'll you'll certainly find you know, as you call it, through lines, um, branches, stitches, spines, um, architecture, bone structure, whatever you're, you know, whatever you'd like to say. Yeah, I'm all for it. I think times like these also necessitate absolutely. It yep, it's a, di a different form of panacea. Mm -hmm. we, we have um, one more, if you don't mind, before we move on to your next sure. piece. Do you feel form has any real meaning besides length and marketing? What does form mean to you as you are writing? Oh, form is, is 
everything really, you know, form is communication, um, form in, in, a, in a poem, in an essay is about the kind of light you want to let in, right? How you want to space things where you want, um, you know, an inflection point, a vocal inflection or the inflection of a breath um, or the inflection of um, an image to land you know, form is everything you need to do in order to land it in that way or to discover what you want to discover. It's architecture, it's, you know, pacing, um, you know, it's, it's decision making about illuminating, you know, image or sound. Um, I may be taking your question in a very broad way. Um, See, going back down to see if um, Michael was that uh, Michael C was that acceptable or is it the kind <laughs> of direction that we're hoping for? Not acceptable in the response, but was it too broad or you think more more specific? Let's see if he responds. Mm -hmm. um, we can we can come back to that too. Sure. Um, I have a question that I'll throw in now. It's a it's a lighter question. We'll see if he responds. And that is, I've had former English as sec second language students, um, I, I talked about as well as pre-college level and college level writing, but they would bemoan verb tenses. They just hated, you know, practicing and studying verb tenses. But I've never heard anyone declare a particular verb tense as their favorite. Can you tell us a little about, <laughs> about why future perfect tense is your favorite verb tense? <laughs> so, um... So Juniper is referring to the last poem in this collection, which is called Future Perfect, which I will now, I will, I will read um, since you set that up so, so beautifully. Um, Future Perfect is, is just this marvel of imagination, right? Where you have to do all of these crisscrossing maneuvers to think about, you know, where you are and aren't and might be and will be and have been. Um, and the, you know, verb tenses, verbs are of course about motion and the more precise, you know, you more precisely you can imagine gestures, you know, and places and geographies, um, you know, the more, uh, you know, astonishing your, your images can be. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, so it's, it's always, it's just so weird too. It's such a weird tense. Yes. So can, can I, um, Please. Please. Okay. so this is, this is called future perfect. Where you were before you were born and where you are when you're not anymore might be very close, might be the same place though neither is as slippery as being here, but imagining where you will have been. That point where things land are finished, over and gone, but not yet. Yes. So that's that. <laughs> A mind bender. I would never have my students study that poem <laughs> so no, no, no. at that level. <laughs> yes, but it yeah. was just so delightful to hear that you had a, a favorite, a favorite tense. <laughs> oh, um, we had a request. If you would mind to please read it again. Yes. So lovely. Yes. Okay. Future perfect. Where you were before you were born, and where you are when you're not anymore, might be very close, might be the same place, though neither is as slippery as being here, but imagining where you will have been, that point where things land are finished, over and gone, but not yet. Thank you. Sure. Are no 
um, new questions and um, well, let's see, there was just a, oh, it's um, going back to the question about structure. Form. Mm -hmm. um, it was a wonderful answer. I'm still curious how poems and essays feel different. I've just noticed that poetry and prose often align more closely as we've gone through history. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, a, a, a gorgeously written sentence can occur anywhere. You know, I, I've, I've read, you know, briefs, you know, by lawyers that are so beautiful, you know, sentence to sentence. Um, and, you know, really any kind of just precise, illuminated, um, efficient, generous writing is, is tingly, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing wherever you find it, so. Yes, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't read too many um, legal briefs recently that I would call <laughs> beautiful, but I'll, I'll hold out for some. I'll hold some out for some. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, okay, how, um, and, and Michael says thank you. How about, do you have another piece to read and I'll hold off on? Um, I have, yes, I'm gonna, I'll read it, uh, just a few excerpts from, an essay Wonderful. and where is this? Okay, so this essay is called Metaphor Studies and it's written in short sections and, and each of these sections is a study in metaphor and trying to sort of, um, I, I'm absolute metaphors. I could sort of think and write endlessly about about metaphor and the the, the sort of magician trick uh, of similes of claiming a thing is is another thing um, or is like another thing. Um, but there's so many ways to to think about metaphors. So this is called this one is called um, skinned muskrat. The story on the radio is being reported in a very particular key, the New York bemused. If you've grown up with this, it just sounds like fact. How quirky and unfathomable are the provinces. For an instant though, the tone shifts and feels more expansive. Like muskrat skinning might be something more, could stand for ambition and translate into values we all understand. Set a challenge, work hard, move up in the ranks. Listening for that note checks smirkiness, quiets a certain form of laughter at the down home things people do. And if that's the way the listening goes, if things get even briefly metaphorical, then we get to be Rhonda, who won this year's contest. She's us at our best, a version of diligence, someone who thinks at night to herself how she might make improvements. At a stoplight considers adjustment, adjustments of tools, the best ordering of gestures, runs replays, feels even as she cuts an apple the musculature's joy in its training, or when undressing a very muddy child, how adept she's become at improvising around slippery problems. You can hear the moment the reporter slows down, deepens her question, depatronizes, gives Rhonda a chance to speak, gets actually interested. Hearing that feels like turning a corner and catching a breeze on an otherwise stifling street. And I'll read one more. Is this your final piece or is it? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I have a question. I'll, um, I'll pose a question for you first. Okay. Uh, it is in, in that um, one of the pieces that I listened to earlier, 
you mentioned leaving the reader dangling, hanging, or suspended. What does it, this mean to you, and where do you strive to leave your readers? Hmm. Where did the dangling and suspended come from? It was the reading and lecture on your campus. Um, and it, it included part of the poems from this most recent collection. Hmm. And if that seems like a hardball question, we can pass. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> Not at all. I don't generally think about leaving anyone suspended or or dangling, although I'm all for the sensation. It's a little uncomfortable. Um, but I, I don't in any I mean, I want to be really, really clear and um, have it might have been in the context of um, part of the poet's work is to leave them maybe like suspended in awe or suspended in question or con contemplation. Hmm but never to leave them dangling, something along that line. Mm, that could be, that could be. Um, the kind of suspension that really, here's how I want to answer that. The kind of suspension that really interests me is an openness and a spaciousness where the words or image itself can, can kind of ring out and, um, and can do so almost wordlessly. And I know that sounds like a paradox um, and poets might know it not to be a paradox, but I'm thinking um, specifically about, about the haiku I'm reading these days, right? And um, I am reading um, and writing about the experience of reading haiku and the way in which, you know, one very incisive image um, moves literally into the body of the reader um, and keeps making meaning, like a mm -hmm. shimmering, right? Um, and forgive the cliche, but the image of, you know, sort of tossing a stone in a pond and watching the rings, um, there's meaning there, right? In that sensation, but the meaning doesn't necessarily have language. And so it's a really interesting, tricky thing that, that um, so many haiku um, can achieve. Um, you know, one very simple image um, that offers questions um, and a kind of space to walk into. Um, so. And, and, yes, and the, the physicality of it. Mm -hmm at least for me, it's not the words, it's how it moves through, how that ripples through, mm -hmm. how the words, and I mean, I'm a synesthete, so I process differently, but mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. that was beautiful. Sorry for putting you on the spot with the dangling and hangling. Not, not at all, not yeah. at all. I, 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 think, I, I think today also, right, I mean, like in the moment, in the sort of moment where we're very much suspended in, um, mm -hmm. practicing, reading deeply and slowly or having to kind of retrain ourselves to do that um, is a measure of kind of regaining um, your sense of what it is to be human. It's really no less than that. Um, we are trained to read in ways that um, engage no gears whatsoever or no sort of heart muscle. And we scroll and scroll and you know endlessly listen to news and I'm including myself here. Mm -hmm. um, recently, you know, that to re retrain yourself to read very slowly and to allow the words to work on you, um, you know, it, it takes just that retraining sometimes. Um, so. Well, thank you for the generous answer. Sure. So the last excerpt I will read very short, um, also from Metaphor Studies is called Prayer. On my way home from, I'm sorry. On my way home after a very long day, I have to decide, should I walk in the street or along the reservoir at the top of the hill? Street, I get to see used condoms, crack baggies, broken sparkles of windshield glass, basic shining urban grit I use to put stories together. Up the hill, I get an expanse of clear water and air 
sweetened by the breath of plants at the banks. Today, up sounds best, like what I need most. Spirit is located up above, no? So I might rise above my worries and in that way lift my heart. Though the reservoir is fenced, another security camera was just installed post 9-11 concerns and a maintenance crew is loudly mowing. Metaphors get compromised, get eroded and need updating, rerouting, reconstituting. Thank you so much. Um, thank Leah, and then I'll make an announcement and then we'll open it up for everybody to be able to say hello or talk. So thank you so much for your time you. and your words and sharing this space. It's been a, a wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, Thanks for having me. It's, um, it has various meanings for me and I won't get too, too mushy and weird right now, Leah, but you've been really formative for me um, thank you. on different levels. So. I, I appreciate you, you taking the time with us. There's a, there are a lot of um, thank yous in the feed. I wanna mention just briefly before I open it up for everybody that we have um, some other um, amazing, outstanding readers coming up. We have Mark Adams, a travel writer on January 24th. Zoya Ahmed, she is a spoken word high school poet laureate of Sonoma County, California on January 31st. C. Marie Furman, February 14th, Michael Sims, February 21st, Octavia Quintanilla, February 28th, and skipping up to Jamin Hill, who is a spoken word world champion on March 7th. So we have a lot of amazing people coming up and um, hope that you join us. And um, I am going to, if my mouse will work here, it looks like it, yep, reconnected maybe. Turn it. Some reason. Oh, there we go. It fell, so it, it was um, not cooperating. So I'm going to um, uh, allow you to unmute yourself. So at this point, you can unmute and say hello or ask a question. And please do if you um, don't have your lovely face shown. Might be a good time to show your lovely face and um, say hello to Leah. You should, are you able to unmute now? Anybody, is that not working? It says that you can unmute yourselves now. If that's not working, I will do it. Um, I'm just going through and, and clicking on all of them and you don't have to talk if you don't want to, but I'm giving you the chance. I'm, I'm just saying hello to people as well. Yes. This is, this is such a weird, you know, the protocols are so weird. So we're, we'll just kind of bumble through this together. Oh, should I call on someone? Sure. Um, I have to have, oh, is this Phil Richards? Are you waving your hand there? Is anybody able to unmute themselves? Is it not working? It's working. I think okay, I did. Good. Okay. Thank you, Leah. That was beautiful. Oh, Buzz. Oh, goodness. It's great to see you. Wow. Amazing. Lovely to see you here, Buzz. Yeah. Thank you, Juniper. Thank you for the evening. It was terrific. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else want to say hello? It doesn't look like standing. Phil, Phil, did you want to say something? Do you have, can you be unmuted somehow? I think you need to unmute yourself, Phil. Just, yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, you did it. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I um, you know, I was really um, well, I was impressed that you liked Emily Dickinson, mm -hmm. and, and that you obviously just don't like East Asian poems, but. <laughs> 
you know, a certain kind of symbolism, symbolism. that moves from feelings and ideas, mm -hmm. you know, to images and metaphors. And um, what I was wondering is, um, you know, am I being unfair to say that your your poems kind of evade history? Um, is that is that unfair? Do you see your lyrics as kind of resisting historical experience for the moment mm. and for the perceptions and the metaphors and symbols that can be drawn out of the moment? Mm. Or um, do you see yourself resisting history to an ex extent? Because that seems, you know, it seems to me that there's a, um, not an evasion, but a movement, you know, away from that towards lyric expression. Mm -hmm. That is such a profound question. And it is one that I think about and ask myself and reflect on all the time. Um, and the question goes something like in my own head, you know, how uh, how do I approach the current moment? How am I adequate to the moment? How clear about, um, not, not clear, how directly do I want to call X, Y, or Z subject, right? And um, I'm very interested in um, directly locating myself in history in, um, in a lot of the essay, in a lot, in a lot of the essays um, in the book, um, I'm interested in what it means to live in Baltimore right now, um, in the neighborhood I live in, like right now. Right. Um, and so um, that is something that you know I'm absolutely working with. You know how how to hold you know the current moment in language and you know, it gets more and more complicated almost every day because, um, you know, what we know of as, you know, reality is either amplified or shifted or undermined. Um, some big explosive thing is happening to it all the time. Um, so it's, it's absolutely a question I'm working with um, really, well, really. I was, I was wondering, one of the things you said in um, that poem was that um, the past has to be reconstituted. It has to be refined into a new set of of metaphors. But can history ever be faced, um, you know, directly on its, you know, on its own terms and its own immediacy? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. I I don't know how to, um, I almost don't know how to think about that unless I'm writing at it. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to take a stab at that, um, you know, as, as a writer and not, um, and not someone just thinking out loud, but, you know, it's, it, it's a way of thinking that I, that I share. If, if, if it's if it's something you're thinking about as well, you know, in your own work, it's something I share too. No, that's uh, no. I think I think about that yeah. uh, in my own uh, in my own work. I mean, I write about history. I write memoir and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and journalism mm -hmm. that involves history. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm interested in lyrics, and I'm interested in the connection of lyrics to history. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, want to say hello? Show your faces. I put Stan on the spot last week and he came out from behind us. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you can see us, but it's your neighbors, Pete and Beth. Oh, <laughs> great. I don't know if you can see us. I can't see us, but I don't know what to click. Um, I see uh, you're in a blank screen there but oh, yeah. now i know you're here thank you that's great to see you yeah and i wanted to say that um, good to know you <laughs> no you're here thank you for
putting your poems and other people's poems up on a little blackboard outside your house during this whole time. Oh, wow. That's a lovely thing. Thank you. I have um, a restaurant menu board, the slate kind. Yeah. And I've been posting poems three times a week since last March. Um, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, new poem um, out on the on the menu board. Um, and it's it's been um, a kind of amazing experience and have I've met so many people. <laughs> And my neighbors are big poetry readers. Who knew? <laughs> yes, I should post it. I'm a very bad Facebooker. <laughs> no, no, that was because you, you posted, you posted it or somebody did once. Pro probably, was... yeah, probably Jed, my husband. He, <laughs> he's much more, he's much, much more adept at this than I am. Thank you, Jed. That's how I knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, lots of thank yous in the comments if you um, have a chance to look at them before. Um, yes. I just want to say thank you again, Leah, for joining us today. It was, this was an absolutely wonderful reading. Lots to think about. Lots to think about. And thank you everybody for joining. <laughs> it was terrific to be here with you all. Thanks for your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Safe. It's very compelling. Thank you. We need the poets. <laughs> we need the poets. We need the poets. Stay safe. More than ever. Thank you. We need the poets. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you also, Leah. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being with us. I, I um, I appreciate your sensibility. Your uh symbolic or universal, whatever, whatever way you want to talk about it, but uh, your aesthetic. Um, and I also, I think I understand what Phil was talking about, also about other kind of poetry that has a more literal uh, historical framework mm -hmm. to it, uh, mm -hmm. content. Uh, I mean, I, I I lean more towards your sensibility in my own poetry, but but uh, I think about the other, and uh, I'm I'm always imagining the the uh, great poem being written, and I wanted the great poem not to be written by myself, but by a lot of other poets at large. That might have been one of them, but uh, that that I know, like uh, I don't know whoever you think are great poets, I guess. Billy Collins, uh, some people don't like his work, but anyway, but it, all, all different people, different kinds of sensibilities. Uh, when 9-11 happened, you know, and I thought we should have had an epic poem that everybody could have conceivably contributed to, or that we should have had that kind of poem, like we've had great epic poems. I mean, if you want to go all the way back to, you know, the Greeks, you know, the Greek ep epic poems and all that sort of thing, like Homer, but I don't think that ever really happened. And I myself never felt up to the chore of doing it. I mean, I knew Galway Connell at that point and some other people that I thought would be excellent mm -hmm. to contribute to something like that. Have, have you ever thought of uh, wanting that kind of poetry? In, I mean, not necessarily even to write it yourself, but to have it be uh, historical, poetic historical documentation of the times that we're living through. You know, I think we need all kinds of poetry. Absolutely. You know, we need, you know, the poetry of like small reeds in mud, and we need, you know, epic poems that tell the story of, you know, the contemporary, the contemporary moment. And, you know, we need love poems and we need anger poems. Um, your idea about an epic community poem to which many people contribute, I think is fascinating. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, I, I can't at the moment think about the logistics of it, but it has the shimmer of something really great. Um, 
someone wrote in the chat, um, we need to like poet or poem our way out of this. Yes. Um, and I think that's a beautiful way to, to say it, you know, uh, to, ver to make it a verb. Let's poet our way into a better future. Yeah. Yes. You know, for, uh, well, so. certainly, certainly the pandemic poem is being, it's, it's already being collected in many anthologies. Yeah. But I, don't know, I don't know that, I mean, by different people, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know that there's been a, a one poem like a long poem yeah no we... I, I i don't not i'm i'm not coming up with anything like that i don't know that you know certain certain sensibilities like to respond immediately um and other sensibilities absolutely can't and i am of the latter you know i need to move um you know slowly and and allow for a lot more space and time to you know let it sort of move move it move in um and you know metabolize um so that's a cool i don't i, I don't want to bear down on you but do you think that the kind of nature poetry we're getting now can imagine our historical moment in the way that um dorothy's talking about because we're we're getting a lot of nature poetry that um, bears down um, really hard on the senses, really hard mm -hmm. on imagery of perception and so forth. Um, do you think there's a pot, um, that there's a danger of evasion? No, I, I mean, or, um, I mean, there's all, I'm sorry. There's I'm all, sorry I think that, I, I made my point. I yeah, sorry, we get we get Zoom uh, crash going on. Yeah. I I think there's always a danger of you know evasion if one sensibility is you know coy, and um, so it's hard to speak about you know nature poetry as having one singular sensibility. Um, you know, poets who are um, uh, accepting and of, of themselves as, you know, animals also accept uh, uh, having to face off with the responsibility we have for what we have done, you know, to, to oh, yeah. the world yeah. and to climate. So there's, you know, incredibly powerful writing coming from every, every, every um, uh, angle at, at the moment, you know, religious, spiritual, um, poetic, uh, journalistic, you know, perspectives on, um, you know, how to live as a part of nature um, and to accept oneself as, um, as animal um, and destructive. And uh, so, you know, I guess um, I'm not seeing the, uh, you know, a singular sensibility when, when we say nature poet, I don't, I can't see, I can't, I don't accept a, you know, a singular sensibility as defining, um, you know, the entire sort of genre. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Stan, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, let me unmute him. Hello. <laughs> it's great to see you, Stan. Yeah. I had trouble getting in on my computer, but my little phone has got me in. Good. Looking good, Leah. Thanks, Dan. You too. Sorry you had trouble, Stan. It's recorded, so you'll be able to listen to it later. Okay, just go on. Mm -hmm. Glad to be here. <laughs> good. That's good. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to say hello? We'll, we'll wind things down and say thank you one more time. Um, it was great to be with you all. You're a really, really good community. And that's the sort of amazing thing about Zoom is that we can be a community, you know, cross country all over. And, you know, and it does, it does feel that way. Um, absolutely. Um, and certainly with this group. So... I do, I, 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 you know, I teach on Zoom 
Um, but I must not forget to be grateful for this kind of community as well. Um, and I am. So thank you all. Yeah, for being here. Yeah. Thank you, Leanne. Um, Take good care. Okay. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, everybody, for showing up. Yeah. Lovely. Lovely, lovely. I will be in touch, Juniper. Okay, me too. Okay, good. Yes. Take, Take good care, everybody. We're down to a few. Good night.